Welcome to Be in True Love. If you've ever read Othello, the famous play by William Shakespeare, you may recall being left with an empty feeling of just why. The antagonist of the story psychologically abuses Othello, and the entire antagonistic plot is just a real mind screw that never really settles with you as you read. It all just seems very sick and twisted. But soon, right here in this video, we actually examine and possibly uncover the real forbidden and hidden central conflict at the core of Othello and why this historical play just might be the Rosetta Stone that shifts all of us to a higher consciousness and a better life on earth. The play Othello by William Shakespeare was actually taken from an earlier book that was published in 1565 by Giraldi Cynthio called Cynthio's Glee Hecatomathy. In this book, a black high-ranking military man without a name, they just referred to him as the Moor, marries a non-black woman named Desdemona and his jealous lower-ranking officer who is secretly in love with Desdemona manipulates the Moor into believing that Desdemona, the Moor's wife, is cheating on him. The Moor goes on um, to kill his wife before he finds out the truth. In Shakespeare's play, the lower-ranking officer is named Lago, and Lago is jealous of Othello. The Moor um, is who Othello is in Shakespeare's Pierce, but um, he's jealous of Othello because of his higher ranking and goes on to manipulate and psychologically torture him into believing that Desdemona, the Moor's wife, is cheating. And just like in Cynthia's story, the Moor, driven mad by psychological games that allow him to second guess himself, loses self esteem and believes the things that Lago is telling him. He kills his wife, but in Cynthia's story, Desdemona's family tortures and kills the Moor rather than um, him killing himself. So now that you understand the basic plot, let's go back and see what was happening in the world at the time this story came out. Please note there are many historical components excluded, mostly so that we stay within a reasonable time limit, but also so that we stay on point. The Hecatomathy came out in 1565, and this was actually the first year that Black enslavement really began catching momentum. Many settlers tried hard to enslave Blacks, but they couldn't really dominate them the way that they wanted to, because in most places throughout the world, Moors were highly regarded and respected. There were king kingdoms and monarchs, and there were the Moors, whom were actually highly esteemed by most of the world because of their many contributions to civilization and their overall human advancement. If you don't already know, ancient civilizations were a lot more technological than most of us realize, and the Moors carried a lot of that knowledge through the generation. So let's look at the timeline. The Moors whom were not just Muslims, like what is perpetuated and taught in modern times as a way to redefine their true identity. Some of them were, but not all. Uh, they began their Spanish rule in the year 711 AD. If we go back further than that, then we could lead ourselves to ancient Nubia, the land of Kush, and ancient Egypt, but we're not going back that far. This is more of a modern review. But just know that the Moors ran much of the world, but they were also the target for many civilizations who did conquer them at many times through the centuries as a way to gain their freedom. The Moors were like the grandmasters who were constantly fought and rose up against. The Ottoman Venetian War from 1463 to 1469 is one example of a war against the Moors that resulted in the Treaty of Constantinople. It's funny how Othello called his play Othello, the Moor of Venice, is the actual name of the play. I wonder if he also had this great defeat in mind. Please go research this information on your own. If you like, keep in mind that the mission for centuries has been to suppress the truth and instead convince the people that they are nothing. So in some of the literature you read in your research, keep that in mind. For instance, if you research the Ottoman Venetian War, you may find the name of a city known as Negro Ponte and things like that. And it all points to the truth that is constantly being suppressed. Anyhow, 
until about eight until about 1482 the moors dealt with a lot of backlash during those five years for centuries several kingdoms were overworking their minds trying to figure out how to get rid of them and their power and you can look this up um look up a movement called the grand program and that was the 11th century where the first sort of tearing down the reputation of the moors began there had long been the idea to change the narrative in and of how people respected and highly esteemed the Moors from positive to negative, but it was usually done subliminally and indirectly. Subliminally and indirectly. When the Spanish raged war on the Moors in 1482, they fought them for nine years until November of 1491, when the Moors submitted and agreed to sign a treaty known as the Treaty of Granada. As a side note, I just want to mention that in 1846, U.S. President Abraham Lincoln did another one called the Treaty of New Granada. It's interesting stuff if you want to research that. Another little side note is that Brit Britain ended up in a seven-year war years later where they took hold of Granada, and this ended with the Treaty of Paris, but the event might be known better as the French and Indian War because, again, they still never desired to refer to those Afro-Grenadians as Black that would completely malign the demo demolishing of more Black history that I speak of today. You can research Afro-Grenadian um, maybe to get more insight. Yet another side note is that even President Ronald Reagan in the 1980s sent troops over to Granada. Um, anyhow, by October of the year 1492, the Spanish crown had already sponsored and or hired Christopher Columbus to voyage, explore, and conquer whatever land and people he could find. Columbus sends a letter to King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella, and that letter was published in April of 1493. The United States Library of Con Congress has it archived if you want to research it. In the letter, Columbus mentions how he arrived on the land and basically just told the Taino people that he was taking over and began to rule them without them fighting back or anything. In Columbus's own words, and I quote, done by proclamation, unfurried and no opposition was offered to me. So for Columbus and his settlers, their first real black slave success, if you will, was with the Taino Indians of the Caribbean. They were the dark-skinned black natives that Columbus thought were Indians. It's funny because we still refer to them as Indians today, but that is mostly because of this skin color and race racist atmosphere that barely allows us to recognize the ancient pre presence of blacks as natives, like the dark-skinned Taino natives, belonging to North and South America, including Cuba, Jamaica, Haiti, Puerto Rico, and the Dominican Republic. Are you bored yet? <laughs> Stay with me because remember our purpose is to bring our timeline up to 1603 when Shakespeare reinvented his version of the Hecatomathy in his play Othello, The More from Venice. Okay, so we're getting close. In 1493, Pope Alexander VI authorized the enslavement and colonization of America. How, you may ask? Well, he said God gave him the right. In fact, this God said so idea was pretty much how the majority of kingdoms came into rule, an exception with whatever peasants succeeded in overtaking a kingdom. If you read Pope Alexander's address from the archives at the Library of Congress or from the U.S. National Library of Medicine, you can sort of absorb the context in which so many powerful changes to humanity happened and so many humans came to rule just by simply saying that God said so. A king is said to be someone who is ordained by God, someone that God personally selects to rule. Priests would often authorize kings, so theologians were extremely important at this time. Other than that, if you were not a Moor, if you were not of a royal family or crazy rich for some other odd reason, then you were regarded as merely a peasant and were just a worker bee meant for labor and servitude. Before we move on, I have to tell everyone a secret. God said, I'm the queen of all of you. So you, whoever you are watching right here, I appoint you to go fix me a bowl of collard greens with a side of cornbread and don't forget the hot sauce. No, <laughs> no just kidding. But you see how it can work out. 
Um, just kidding, though. But imagine how ridiculous this now sounds that we have all awakened, okay? So Columbus enslaved the Thanos, but he also nearly wiped out their entire population. They were not murdered. Um, I mean, they were not just murdered, or if they didn't die from the brutal burden of enslavement, then they died of diseases from cattle and other human transported diseases that the Thanos were foreign to. You can look up uh, more on that by going to the U.S. National Library of Medicine online under the Native Voices timeline, okay? Um, so Columbus, under Spain and Portugal, was trying so hard to develop this new world where the Moors would not be sovereign or have any rule. Whenever you look back on history, you can conclude that Columbus was trying to get away from the Moors, but the founding fathers of the United States, who signed the Declaration of Independence in 1776, hundreds of years after Columbus existed, um, they were trying to get away from the British. So there were many other things going on in the world with the Moors all over the various continents. We focus on Columbus because it brings us to the current state of blacks today. So he was working the breath out of these people while also eliminating their culture and their existence. By 1496, Columbus became the governor over the Dominican Republic. It was called Santo Domingo back then. The Spanish and Portugal crown who funded him to voyage, explore, and conquer were not seeing the financial rewards of their investment. They sent men to investigate what Columbus was doing and or what he had established. So in about 1500, uh, the Spanish crown sent a man named Fr Francisco de Babadillo out to basically check Columbus, check on Columbus, and check their slave investments as well. When Francisco Babadillo pulled up on him at the Ozark River in Santo Domingo, which is now the Dominican Republic as we know, Francisco Babadillo was shocked at what he saw, which was many of his own officers and army men hanging from stakes and gallows because Columbus had murdered them when they refused to listen to his governance. Columbus was arrested but returned for his final voyage back to the Americas in about 1502. Some of his issues in trying to take over were due to his inability to induct a meme or mind virus in the native people. And I suspect that maybe this is why he murdered some of his own officers as well. He needed a meme like those who were priests or kings and queens. All priests, kings and queens had to say was because God said so. But it was just not really working for Columbus. So Columbus, I believe, knew he could make the racial divide mean work, but the genocide of the Thano people left him without slaves to induct a meme on too. Columbus decided to fall back on an old adagi that worked through the ages in overcoming black minds against their own pride, self-esteem, and prestige associated with the essence of blackness that was through the usage of images to regard the Christian God as being white when all along the Jesus story itself is a plagiarized story of Horus. So I'm going to say that again, okay? So Columbus decided to fall back on an old adagi that worked through the ages in overcoming black minds against their own pride, against their own self-esteem, against their own sense of prestige associated with the essence of blackness. And that was through the uses of images to regard the Christian God as being white when all along the Jesus story itself is the plagiarized story of Horus, okay? If you want more information on the original story of Horus, you can go to beingtruelove.com, of course, and click on Perceptions, then click on, um, then click on, uh, next go to Age, Astronomy, and 12 Signs Constellations. Then scroll all the way down until you get to the video link. And next, brace yourself because if this is your first time hearing it, all right? Now with all that said, we come to the end of our timeline in 1603 where Shakespeare recreates the Hecatomathy as a play called Othello, the Moor of Venice. 
In my analysis, the play Othello, The More From Venice, was revealing the strategic psychological torture that has been used to continuously malign the progressive thinking and self-esteem of Blacks as the primary vice to dominate. In the play, the more from Venice is strong and worthy in all areas of life, but his mind is weak as he allows himself to be manipulated and ultimately self-destruct. And this is and was how blacks have continued to see centuries and decades of loss in power, loss in self-perception, loss in family bonds, loss of generational wealth, loss in history, loss in identity, and an overall loss in progress. The antagonist Lago in Othello's book can represent the consistent, systematic, and psychological scheme to convince Blacks that they are unattractive, less intelligent, less human. The depiction of Jesus as a white god subliminally rescinds the message over and over as it was meant to do from the moment the story was copied from the ideology of Horus, where Horus, like many other ways of understanding astronomy and astrology, was or is simply an anthropomorphized description of the sun. Just a side note, Anthropomorphize simply means to give an object, animal, or human characteristics. For example, if I give my favorite car a name, let's say I give my car the name Amber, and I begin to reference it only as Amber. I tell people, oh, I'm going to watch Amber today, or Amber needs a tune-up. This is what anthropomorphizing is, and this is what early humans did to describe parts of the sky as a way to better understand. Just like astrology, Aries the ram and what is that? A cluster of stars that we can recognize because of this anthropomorphizing. Like the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper in the night sky. Horus and Set as sunset were used in this same way. The rise and death are all representative of events that happen in astronomy. Blacks have been indoctrinated with self-destruction strategically. Blacks have been taught to self-destruct themselves, not knowing the true power of words and thoughts. Through music is just one, one of many examples black have, Blacks have been exploited to reinvent self-destructive programming, while the strategists made lots and lots of money while also succeeding in maligning an entire culture. If you think about some of the lyrics and music that many people gain fame and riches from by talking about killing and murdering, glorifying the devalue of women, adding luster to family dysfunction, dignifying substance abuse, and a range of other self-destructive mind viruses that stagnate growth and prosperity. Many made a living out of these things mentioned literally running the self-destructive program, downloading it and burning it into the subconscious. <clears throat> Excuse me. None of what I just said is mentioned in judgment in any form or fashion. I too am guilty of ghostwriting many of these types of lyrics as well as listening to them. It is truly addicting because the feeling is euphoric almost. You sing along innocently while tragically downloading and burning these malignant messages into your vibrational frequency. I myself even find myself hooked too. I love music of all types and actually still love some of those most hardcore, grimy lyrics. I too continue to find myself in a law of vibration. No one is perfect. I practice being the change I want to see and sometimes fall short myself, but the point is I continue to be purposeful, ambitious, and motivated to really embody that change I wish to see, that change I will be. I have been working on myself for eons with many on on top of many regressions i say all that to say that no one is better than anyone else the only thing that makes one great is their zeal to be better than the person they were yesterday anywho going back to shakespeare's play in Shakespeare's play, Othello kills his wife, who was a non-black. Now for that component of it, I also wondered if the overall oppression of women was being represented as well, but my mind has yet to fathom that component of the story. If you have a theory, I would love to hear about it. Maybe you can share your thoughts in the comments section. Part of me wonders if non-black men during the era of the Moors were having a hard time getting women overall, and if that was also a motivation. Just 
just wondering, just trying to figure it out. In the Hecatomathy, recall that the storyline was that the antagonist was jealous of the Moor because of the antagonist being secretly in love with and rejected by the Moor's wife when he attempted to connect with her. Very different from Shakespeare's story where the antagonist is jealous of the Moor's status. Decade by decade, we can see how Blacks continue to be marginalized, oppressed, and self-destruct. And the primary thing that this video wants to represent is that psychological torture and self-hate is the primary strategy that has been used to dominate, oppress, marginalize Blacks and Black culture, and it is time to change and stop focusing on that. Humans get more of what they focus on. This is also part of the strategic plan. Notice how events that make Blacks believe they are absolutely hated by everyone and inferior keep coming up in the news. If it is actually true that everyone despises Blacks, then how is it that the entire world stood up against the treatment and murder of George Floyd? Humans get more of what they focus on, and over the last few decades, through the web, gaming, Facebook, dating sites, and just about every and anything to be named socially, humans have begun to recognize that they are more alike than they are different and has consistently spread across the globe. One can easily recognize that there is much strategy in highlighting grotesque murders while also doing senseless acts of violence against innocent people without warrant. While the acts are true and did happen, if Blacks continue to believe that they are cheated, sacrificed, and hated the same way that the more Othello in Shakespeare's play believed his wife was cheating on him, then Blacks will continue to self-destruct and go mad. When we see these acts of injustice against Blacks, then that is just what they are, acts of, injust uh, acts of injustice, and we can assume that some of them are strategically done. It sounds foolish to ignore these things, and maybe you do not have to completely, but overall, being stronger-minded and choosing to function within the understanding that the world actually loves, supports, and appreciates Blackness overall will begin to make a great change. If we choose to focus on how horrible and cheated Blacks are instead of focusing on building one another up, focusing on repairing families, focusing on speaking life, focusing on rearing children, focusing on establishing success, success, focusing on love, focus on being the change we would like to see, then we will begin to change things by each individual changing and reimagining who and what we are. Now, understanding all that we do about history from this short video, I think moving forward, it is healthy for the focus for all humanity to simply forget about the idea of color. <laughs> we have all had a significant contribution to culture and advancements of all kinds. No one should be oppressed, and by all means, no one should be self-destructing and oppressing their own self. It is time to focus energy on love and progress. In my own research regarding race, I came up with the theory that skin color is just a byproduct of climate change through the many Earth cycles of human development. Imagine, if you will, how hundreds or even thousands of years ago, during an ice age, for example, the Utah Geological Survey informs that the last known ice age was roughly 20,000 years ago and that the average daily temperature at that time was 10 degrees Fahrenheit. You might be thinking that you know places colder, but no, I looked up Minnesota myself <laughs> because that is an absolutely icy place and can get to maybe 17 degrees Fahrenheit or well below zero on the Celsius end. We're talking exclusively Fahrenheit though. However, even though many places drop to low temperatures, they do not stay that way daily for years at a time without an edge of warmth. And so this is what we are referencing and talking about an ice age. If it is that cold outside, how do you think humans will respond? I have danced around this in my mind for so long that I convinced myself that black folks and white folks were opposite inside one another. I thought of how if the sun was not shining as much, 
maybe the body would develop melanin as a way to absorb more heat. And maybe nappy hair acted as a fur around the skull. I could not determine no shape, but I know in my own experience in walking to school just as a little girl on some cold mornings, I thought of how it was really cold out. It helped me to cover my nose because breathing in would sometimes hurt my throat onto my ears or vocal cords. So maybe it was the cold that generated black folks. If so, then what about white and could the same be true? I imagined, just imagine, that if it was unbearably hot outside, what would I do? I immediately imagined that I would seek shade and shelter. I'd probably end up in a cave, but how long could I or anyone stay in a cave? I thought to myself that the carbon dioxide from a fire inside a cave could, cre could create problems after a period of time. So maybe my nose would thin and point as a natural filter and maybe the nappy fur of hair would fall flat from humidity and also as a natural adaptation to try to cool me off. How would it do that? I wondered and I thought maybe my skin would produce more oil within my sebaceous glands to cool me off, plus flatten my hair, and maybe the melanin would leave the skin so as not to absorb more heat. I mean, if it's that hot outside, right? But wait, would I have a fire in a cave at all since it's so hot outside? <laughs> I don't know. But I then imagined that the nighttime temperatures would be warm also. Or is it that with the sun, everyone got darker, as we all readily assume, and with the cold, everyone got light and sought caves and started a fire for warmth. I don't know, but the point is, who knows? And more importantly, who the fuck really cares? <laughs> the color of our skin simply does not matter. It only matters in a society where capitalism thrives. It only matters in a space where someone needs to make up something stupid to feel better than someone else. In a basic college biology course, I recall being made aware of the amazing adaptation of a moth. This moth was a regularly old moth with beige to white body and feathers. Pollution and black soot in the air got on some of these moths and would turn them black or have black speckles. Birds who sought out the moth to eat began to skip over the black speckled ones or the black ones because they did not taste so good anymore. Or maybe they could not see them. Who knows? But the point is that over a short period of time, a new generation of moths began to be born with the black speckles on them. But they had not yet been exposed to the pollution. So this was an amazing thing. The moths adapted to survive. It was passed down through their DNA to code for this external feature as a survival mechanism. I imagine that humans have done the same, and many of us carry several versions and isotopes of the genome. This is our magic. I just bet it is. One of the laws of thermodynamics says that energy cannot be created or destroyed. The energy of the universe is constant and cannot be created or destroyed. It exists and is merely transferred from one being or thing to another. In the universe, there is only love and fear. We gather more energy of love or we gather more energy of fear. The universe is neutral and does not pick and choose good or bad. The energy just flows and transfers as we direct it, and we direct energy through words and thoughts, literally. This really is how it all works. So in ending this video, I will leave you with a quote by Shakespeare himself, and I quote, All the world is a stage, and all the men and women are merely players. With that said, be strong in mind, stronger if you can. Watch what you are thinking and saying because this will become what you are doing. It can be really challenging. Trust me, I know. It can be truly hard to focus on love, success, and the good that there is. And none of us are perfect. None of us are perfect at it. Not every time, but practicing it. Every chance you get and staying focused on being the change you want to see will bring results. Surround yourself with like-minded people. Start distancing yourself from people who focus on negativity. Stay away from people who you recognize are part of the problem. And most important of all, be the change you are trying to see. Last but not least, 
I just want to say that the information shared in this video is meant to open the ways of love to flow gracefully through the heart and mind of each individual who has the opportunity to watch it. This is not just an ethnocentric attempt to assert one type of human over another. Not at all. No one is better than anyone else, and I sincerely believe that. I sincerely believe that all the actions and harm committed by one race to another were done as a method of survival. Whites depended on blacks' oppression as a way to free themselves, and that does not make it right at all. But the element of survival is at the core of every human being. It is up to each individual to choose love above all other things. In time, the ultimate hope is that we can move out of this monetary society since the byproduct is capitalism and oppression. If you want to learn more about the power of your thoughts and words, you can utilize beingtruelove.com as a way to educate and reprogram your thinking. You can contact Being True Love admin by phone or email, and all the information is on the Being True Love website. Thank you for watching, and try to remember the best and most powerful way to make change is to be the change you wish to see in the world. Speak life and prosperity into this world, and especially into those marginalized and oppressed. Okay, so thank you. I just want to say one last thing. This will pretty much be the last time I address this topic in this way. Um, several years ago, I had a title of Sacramento African American Issues Examiner, where I produced articles and published daily about these types of topics. Um, I organized protests, and um, I learned even back then a lot of the protests I organized it would be a lot of people of all different races and that kind of blew my mind several years ago but what i learned um in fighting that fight is what i know now that we get more of what we focus on with this recent um george floyd i went out to peaceful protest but my mission was to bring love to the table so i went out and kind of like tried to set a tone where we were at and try to get the understanding that we are ready to receive the love that you can give because it's in there inside you <laughs> rather than um, the latter. And that's no judgment to anybody. Everything happens for a reason and I don't have any judgment about any good or bad responses that I've seen. But I do know surely and really truly and honestly believe that we get more of what we focus on and so everything that i just mentioned um please refer to that but this will be the last time that this topic is addressed moving forward is being true love thank you kindly have a uh, good day thanks for watching